So, uh, honorable mayor and council members, we're going to do a homeless update. We have some of the reoccurring topics, but as requested, we are going to cover the care court, the governor's proposal for care court. And tonight, this homeless update is going to be given by Ken Gamitsky, who is our part-time homeless services manager, and he is really the one that is on the street level and is best adapted at giving this presentation as well as answering any questions you may have. Ken Gamitsky. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, even when I'm not here, I sit at home and I watch the uh, Council meeting just like everybody else. So I knew I'd be here to answer some questions that came up last time, and I'm looking forward to having that discussion. Tonight, we're going to talk about ongoing cult activity and highlights, our efforts with the SMART program, something called the Homeless Management Information System, or HMIS, the Governor's Care Court proposal, and the system of the uh, Homeless Navigation Center. Let's start with Colt. In March, Colt continued its daily coordinated responses throughout the city. Colt contacted 335 different individuals that were experiencing homelessness, providing outreach services as well as enforcement action when necessary. They conducted 417 cleanups of various sites and of various sizes. These cleanups are generally larger in scale and require more time to perform than routine public works cleanups. This was up from 399 cleanups in February. Colt performed or was engaged in 112 arrests or the issuance of citations for various offenses. And Colt placed or assisted in the placement of 80 individuals into some form of shelter. <clears throat> now our update on SMART. And again, SMART is the enhanced partnership with CityNet that we're engaged in as we address homelessness. If you look at the screen, you'll see that between December 1st of 2021 and April 25th of 2022, the SMART team has engaged in 2,528 outreach contacts, has provided case management to 838 individuals currently experiencing homelessness, 418 individuals have been exited from the streets of Santa Ana. That's into shelter, into families, into permanent supportive housing, uh, any number of different uh, mechanisms to get people off of the streets. Uh, 508 total COVID-19 engagements. What I think is truly important is to look towards the bottom and see 3,666 calls dispatched. That's 2,311 that came in directly from our community. 519 calls that were came from the Santa Ana Police Department or the Orange County Fire Authority. 465 calls by way of the My Santa Ana app. And 371 uh, proactive contacts. What I also find interesting and would like to share is in discussions with the Santa Ana Police Department, uh, what I'm hearing is, is that calls for service in regards to homeless-related homeless related activity are dropping dramatically, meaning that as calls for service can be sent to SMART, that is freeing up our officers' time. But just as importantly, when you consider as we have talked about here many, many times. The amount of time that it takes law enforcement to respond to a call for service can be protracted depending upon the call for service type. On average, SMART is reporting that they have a 24-minute response time. I do know, because I've talked to several of you about this, that response time is not 24 minutes across the board. 
However, on average, SMART is responding in about 24 minutes, which is a fairly, I think, impressive response rate, uh, considering how long we know that it takes our law enforcement to respond to some types of calls. SMART operates seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And I would again like to bring to the attention of the community that the SMART phone number is 714-242-3706. Next, I'd like to discuss a highlight that I consider to be a true reflection of all of the different components of the Santa Ana homeless response to an incident of teamwork in the field. An encampment with two individuals sleeping in front of a business that was opening was observed. Colt officers contacted the individuals who were sleeping and spoke with them about shelter and various resources that could be offered. The two males explained they had medical issues and when I talk about medical issues, if you look on the picture on the upper right, you'll see an individual with large abscesses all on his uh, right leg. Uh, what you can't see is even larger abscesses on his left leg, and the under other individual had similar types of medical issues. Aside from the medical issues, these individuals had warrants and that prevented them from being able to go to shelter. Colt officers immediately contacted the SMART team and the SMART team, SMART team arrived on scene to support Colt. Colt and SMART together identified these medical issues, which included severe infections of all of their legs based on long-term narcotics use. Both males were suffering from cellulitis and severe cases of MRSA. One, uh, we'll just say that the injuries were severe. Officers explained that a medical response team could come to the location to address their wounds and try to get them further medical care through a recuperative care facility because, again, these individuals were resistant to even go to the hospital. If you look up at the uh, center picture above the slide seven, you'll see the county's mobile medical response unit that is staffed with uh, a doctor and uh, medical professionals. The medical response unit arrived on scene, provided triage and medical assistance for our two homeless individuals with the medical issues. After they had worked on them for some time, they managed to secure locations at a recuperative care facility, and those individuals were transported to that recuperative care facility. Next, we have the Homeless Management Information Center system. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the federal agency that provides homeless-related funding to state and local governments, requires participation in something called the Continuum of Care, or the COC. Involvement in the COC requires the use of a computerized data collection system, which the county has named HMIS. HMIS is used to measure homelessness and the effectiveness of related service delivery systems and is the primary reporting tool for HUD homeless service grants, as well as for other public streams of funding related to homelessness. Uh, we had an opportunity to speak to one of the council members in regard to data collection as it pertains to homelessness. And this is an example of what HMIS information is available. 211 OC, designated by the Continuum of Care to operate HMIS and is the lead agency for the County of Orange. 
Based on all the information that they receive from all of the outreach and engagement that is provided by not only the county, but the nonprofits throughout the county, this data set is populated. Now, as it sits now, it's stagnant, but if you go to 211 and you click on any of the different items, such as 510 people in street outreach, it then changes all the data to reflect what disability information specifically ties to that street outreach. How many clients left domestic violence and are now on the street? This information is powerful as we look at what are the different needs our homeless population has. This is a uh, different set of data that is also collected by way of HMIS. Next, council requested further information on what's being referred to as the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Court Proposal. As it is proposed, this is a framework to deliver court-ordered mental health and substance abuse disorder services for individuals experiencing homelessness. CARE Court is progressing through the state legislature as Senate Bill 1338 authored by Senators Tom Umberg and Susan Talamantes Eggman. I have been following this and found that there is quite a bit of discussions going on in regards to that. Core components of CARE Court. CARE Court is a proposed framework to deliver mental health and substance use disorder services to individuals who need it. It connects a person in crisis with a court-ordered care plan for up to 12 months with the possibility to extend for an additional 12 months. The framework provides individuals with a clinically appropriate community-based set of services and supports. This includes court-ordered stabilization medications, wellness and recovery supports, connection to social services, and a housing plan. You can imagine that this is probably going to have quite a bit of difficulty as it works its way through the legislature. How it's planned or proposed to work? A referral occurs. An individual with untreated schizophrenia spectrum or other psychotic disorders who lacks medical decision-making capacity may be referred to the court by a family member, behavioral health provider, first responder, or other approved party to provide care and prevent institutionalization. Following, a clinical evaluation will be provided. The civil court would order that a clinical evaluation occur and appoint a public defender and something referred to as a supporter. Court reviews the clinical evaluation, and if the individual meets the criteria, the court orders the development of a care plan. The care plan is developed by county behavioral health, the participant, and the supporter, including behavioral health treatment, stabilization medication, and a housing plan. Court reviews and adopts the care plan with both the individual and county behavioral health as party to the court order for up to 12 months. County behavioral health care team with participant as well as the supporter would begin treatment and regularly review and update the ongoing care plan as needed as well as a mental health advance directive for any future crises. Court provides accountability with status hearings for up to a second 12 months if needed. Successful completion and graduation by the court. Participant remains eligible for ongoing treatment, supportive services, and housing in the community to support long-term recovery mental health advance directives put in place for any future crises.
staff continues to monitor 1338 as it moves through the legislation. Uh, and I believe that uh, all of you on the dais and everybody at home know about as much about this as I do, as it continues to change and morph as it works its way through the state legislature. Lastly, what I know you have all been waiting for is our update on the Santa Ana police or Santa, City of Santa Ana Homeless Navigation Center. Yesterday, the temporary woman's emergency shelter, which is housed within the Homeless Navigation Center, opened in the southeast corner of our site. The emergency shelter ordered by U.S. District Court Judge David Carter, includes a woman's only residential area for a limited number of women, separate restrooms for shelter and staff, office spaces for staff, two exits that flow through a two-hour rated fire corridor, and an exterior path of ingress and egress. This emergency shelter area is currently separated from the rest of the building through locked access doors and temporary solid barricades. As the construction continues, more dorms and staff rooms will become accessible. Of key importance, four women asleep on the streets of Santa Ana on Sunday night took the courageous step to accept shelter Monday afternoon. In speaking to these women, I knew two of the four. The key difference in accepting shelter yesterday versus the many times before was the shelter was in Santa Ana, close to their doctors, close to the social service appointments they had. They needed and wanted to stay in Santa Ana, which is their home. Each one of this, these women is already working with CityNet and the Illumination Foundation to secure permanent supportive housing. But while they wait to become document ready and secure that permanent supportive housing, they will finally be safe inside of our shelter. The photos shown on your screen provide a snapshot of the progress at this site. Last week, the asphalt was replaced and parking striping occurred over the weekend. And every day, is another new challenge. The second floor continues to move forward with completion of restrooms and the installation of carpet. I saw pictures, the carpet is in. The ability to open the remainder of the shelter is directly tied to completion of the second floor based on the fire alarm and the Illumination Foundation staff needs as they move forward in providing the wraparound services for the homeless population that we will be paying for. Here it comes. Although a completion date remains difficult to specifically identify, it will be arriving very soon. I know that each and every one of you on the dais, as well as everyone I work with and deal with within City Hall asks on a daily basis, when will the shelter be done? It remains a moving target. We have had promises and promises and promises, and then it's something new, and then it's something else that's new. I can simply assure you that your city manager, your assistant city manager, and your executive directors have thrown virtually everything they can as far as support towards the completion of this shelter. If the contractor decides or requests for some kind of inspection, your inspection team is there. When the fire department needs to inspect the fire alarm or the fire sprinkler, we have received above and beyond service from them. 
When Public Works is asked to come out and help move things and get the shelter ready, Nabil has been incredibly gracious. Every single one of your executive directors has stepped up and is doing their part to try to get us to the finish line. I would love to be able to tell you it's this date, but I have never in the past, and I will not tonight, lie to you. I can just tell you we're close. I am ready for any and all questions. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation, uh, Mr. Gaminski. Very thorough and brace yourself. Um, just kidding. Um, let me go ahead and bring it back to the council for any questions or comments. Um, anybody uh, want to start? All right, I see uh, Councilmember Hernandez. Thank you, um, Mayor Samantha. Impressive how you caught me. Um, you're not here in person. But um, thank you for your presentation, sir. Um, my question pertains to members of the public. So recently I got a call from a resident um, that was by First and Sullivan and said that there were um, people experiencing homelessness there that wanted assistance, um, that live by the um, mobile homes that are there. And um, a lot of the times people that are driving home, you know, you see somebody, you know, after a while you get to know them. Mm -hmm. And they had requested some assistance and, um, and they live there adjacent to this parking lot and said that after I had made a request to have um, somebody go out there to help them, that nobody showed up and that they were watching for over two hours. So could you confirm how can members of the public ensure um, that the contacts that they're making, that there is follow-up? I followed everything until the last part. How can the general public ensure that the contacts that SMART is making, that there is follow-up, or the contacts they're making to you is there's follow-up? Yes, so do we have a system that is conclusive that says um, we have identified or we have not identified that said individual that needs assistance? So uh, specifically for your instance, I reached out to the SMART team mm -hmm. and I had them dispatched. I can call the SMART team and find out when they were dispatched, what time they arrived, and who they spoke to. I have the ability to do those kinds of things, just like if uh, anybody wanted to call the watch commander and find out what the, the answer to a call for service might be. So I have the ability to go back and follow up on any call for service that the SMART team is dispatched to. Okay. And I'll be more than willing to give my email address out, and anybody that has any issues or problems with the SMART team response can send me an email, and I'll be more than happy to check into it and get back to them. Thank you, sir. And for members of the public, let's say in this instance, um, you live by um, a, a location where there is uh, a, a small group of people that are, that are seeking shelter, um, how can they go about um, requesting services and assistance um, for people that are willing to get that help? So the city's preference is that individuals continue to use the My Santa Ana app. Mm -hmm. The best way for us to ensure that something happened with that request is to put it into a system that doesn't rely on word of mouth, but it's data driven, and that that data then gets pushed, that we can then follow up with and say what happened when this specific incident was addressed. I will say this. Um, it is my experience that a lot of people that the normal everyday person talk to who's homeless will say, I am willing to go to a shelter right now. And when the cult team or the smart team show up and say, okay, we're ready to go, there's hesitancy. And there's generally some hesitancy that we would say, how about if you come back in an hour? Or I have to do this and this and this. How about if you come back tomorrow? Because when these individuals choose to take that step, 
it is a courageous act on their part. It really is. And so just because they tell somebody who wants to help them who's not part of the system uh, that I'm willing to go, I'm willing to go, if they're willing to go, we have places for them. We do. Uh, they may not like some of the rules or some of the regulations. Uh, we don't have as many couples beds as we should. And some people are unwilling to be separated from their partners even for short times. So when we're talking about sheltering individuals, it is a com incredibly complex thing. And we just have to continually remind ourselves that when these people do decide to go, we have to have a place for them that will work with their needs. Thank you, sir. And my last question is, how many follow-ups happen before a person does commit to saying, I'm ready to go, um, get that help? So I have a lot of experience in talking to people, but I think maybe it takes more time if a cop goes up to you a hundred times, maybe you're less, maybe a little more resistant. But I can tell you that on average in talking to CityNet, it might take a minimum of 20 contacts. That sounds a minimum, right. A minimum of 20 contacts to develop a, a rapport. Mm -hmm. It was funny, I was at the shelter this morning when uh, another lady was transported and dropped off. Uh, she's been living at the corner of uh, 3rd and Baker, I believe it was, for some time. And they had tried and tried and tried. CityNet said that they'd probably gone up to her and talked to her for 30 times. However, today they said, how about if we just take you over to this shelter and you can take a look and see if you want to stay. And she got there, she got all excited. She had her cigarette, walked over and gave me a hug. It was a good day. And decided she was gonna stay and try to make it work. Um, it's a big step for her, mm -hmm. big step for her. But Santa Ana had a place for her, it was a good day. Thank you, sir, that concludes my question. Thank you, sir. Excellent comments, excellent responses. Uh, just to the AV team, when you pull back this way, it really helps me see who has their hands raised and I can totally uh, I'm calling you. That way uh, it makes it a lot easier. That way I'm not guessing by voice. But I see uh, I see council member fans hand up and uh, I'll call on her and whoever's ready can, can be uh, 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 ready to go after that. Thank you. Um, I, I guess it's not so much questions but a request um, regarding care court. I, I understand the reason for it. You know, there are a lot of folks who are experiencing houselessness who are unable to take care of themselves, they have medical needs. But frankly, it also evokes a lot of fear in my heart because we know that there is also, you know, once some, for example, in the conservatorship world, it's very hard and the people who are most um, affected by conservatorships tend to be those with, uh, wh whether it's a mental disability or physical disability, and frankly, everybody's heard about Free Britney, and that's someone who's a multimillionaire, super famous pop star who was under a conservatorship for, you know, over a decade. So I worry with a program like this that we end up going back into a system in which we do start to institutionalize people that we feel, we start taking away their um, decision-making ability and their uh, ownership of themselves. And I know it's a difficult balance um, with, with public health, their own health, and, and you know, we 5150 folks when we fear that there's a uh, harm to themselves or others, but it's temporary. So I just, I guess as you know, um, information about this moves on, I would love to continue to get updates about um, how this legislation changes and how it might affect us here in Santa Ana. And it could be an email, it doesn't have to be, because I know bills change with every committee. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am, we'll provide that. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Lopez. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Sarmiento. Um, so, um, can I have a question? Because I get pinged a lot on this. This is like the number one issue in our area. 
and um, it can you you have a law enforcement background, so I think you would be you're you're able to answer this question. Um, for folks that report seeing people that are nude, can you please explain the process of what kind of enforceable action that is? So the city of Santa Ana has a municipal code against public nudic, nudi, nudiness, public nudity, nudity, <laughs> nudity not nudiness. Uh, so there's a municipal code for that. Uh, there are also California Penal Code laws that apply to um, people being in various forms of undress, uh, but in order for those laws to kick in, generally they have to be doing something for some type of sexual gratification. But With that being said, our public nudity SA, Santa Ana Municipal Code um, talks about um, areolas being exposed, genitalia being exposed, the buttocks below the cleft, I believe. So if a Santa Ana resident sees that, uh -huh. what is the process for them? What, what should they do and what should they expect out of our police department? So misdemeanors not committed in a police officer's presence cannot be enforced. So there's a difference between the felony and a misdemeanor. Felonies, much more serious crimes. If a resident sees somebody robbing somebody else and the officer doesn't see that robbery, the officer can make an arrest because it's a felony. For misdemeanors, a misdemeanor, an officer has to see that crime occur in their presence. So unless the officer sees the public nudity, they can't do anything. The general public does have the ability to make a private person's arrest for that. However, those... So in short, you're saying if I see someone nude at the park in the street and I call SAPD and they don't see it, that's not an enforceable action, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm just trying to explain yes. it. <laughs> no, I know, I know. And I just want to, I want the, I want people to understand that because that's one of the top okay. concerns that I often get questions about. And I will tell them that and they'll be like, you're lying to me. And I let them know, like, this is the information that I have received from de our department. Um, so another question that I have for you is, and I actually would love our code enforcement manager to come up here if he's able to. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know about that. You know, here. Can you explain to the public the role of private businesses in collaboration with the city? Okay. So, good question. Uh, because, you know, to, to put it mildly, we try to balance the universe, right? So, we understand that the city has a responsibility and we have a commitment to help. But um, we're taking a perspective that private property owners have to make some type of investment in, in helping us in try to address some of those concerns, especially on private property. So for example, when we get a code enforcement type of concern regarding homeless or transients, we have to balance this perspective from the private property owners when they're being concerned that folks are going to their property trespassing or taking stuff or sleeping within their, their uh, perimeter. But we can't just go out and kick them out for the sake of, of removing folks if they're not doing something illegal. That means the private property owner has to do certain things. This is where the famous 602 form comes in, the no trespassing. This is the whole point about folks um, putting in additional lighting, right? Trimming some bushes so the folks don't, don't um, live or, or use that as part of their sleeping purposes. So they can then take advantage of the homeless services that we provide. Right, uh, making sure they secure, for example, the trash can area. 
So it's not used for, sort of for vandalism or access or other criminal activity. So when we go out there, we try to look at those type of, of, of perspectives, making sure that the property owner has some level of responsibility in addition to the city providing services. So it's a balanced approach. Okay, thank you. And, and, and for what it, so I clarify, and sometimes though, we are required to issue notices, and I say that in a mild manner, more as a corrective aspect, but again, like extra lighting, right, securing some items, making sure that the property is vigilant and maintained adequately goes a long way. If a property looks abandoned or that folks are not interested in maintaining the property, then you're gonna get that level of attraction. Okay, thank you, Alvaro. Um, and I think that's really important for the public to understand because we want to, and you know, we want to be able to have these partnership with private businesses. But I do not believe the city of Santa Ana should be subsidizing all of the cleanups on behalf of these giant corporations. I don't think that's fair for our residents. And so. I know Alvaro, the planning staff, code enforcement, we get emails on a daily basis. And these are some of the two top questions that we always get. And so I wanted to have this dialogue, you know, in the open um, so that people understand, you know, what is the process? What is the train of thought behind how we are doing things now? Um, so those are going to be all of my questions. Thank you. To your point also, when you talk about these big property owners and not wanting to subsidize them, that's specifically why the city attorney uh, filed the suits against Union Pacific Railroad for exactly that. Thank you, council member. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and then council member Benyanos. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Sarmiento. Um, you already know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> 24 minutes, huh? That's what they tell me. That's what my data shows. Now, before you got here, last time our city manager had to hear me say this, there are lies, there are damn lies, then there are statistics, right? We all know that adage. Um, you know, I I could go around and tell everybody to use the My Santa Ana app. Mm -hmm. I know from my own experience using it, it is efficient, it is effective. I hear other people tell me it's efficient and effective. I have very rarely heard somebody tell me no way, no, they never cleaned up the graffiti. It took them two weeks to do it. On the smart line though, that's all I'm hearing. I have not heard any of the success stories. I have not heard somebody say, 24 minutes, no, we, we saw them in 12. No, that is not happening. So I know today's an update, but I would say as you're taking the feedback from this council, understand that what we're hearing from the community, what we're experiencing ourselves, because I'm out there, it's not working. And, and the responses are terrible as far as timing-wise. So the idea that, as I said last time, if, if calling SMART is meant to be the substitute for calling PD just for the response, I'm not talking about the type of response, but just for folks that aren't going to get into the weeds of who does what and when, all they know is they're calling a number that they have on the fridge and they expect a response. They're not getting it. So that that is a, a concern for me. Um, the shelter completion, just, just so we're all clear, the, the requirement for the shelter comes from Judge Carter, correct? Through the uh, settlement? The, man, the, the idea that we have a shelter in place comes from a settlement with the federal court, yes sir. Okay, so, so our, our tenacity in pursuing this is to um, uphold the obligation that we entered into, correct? As well as the city's commitment to deal and do our fair share for the homeless. Correct, but I, I'm saying is that, I mean, for, for all, because most of the time, our shelters, even prior to um, not having Red Hill and Dyer, we were not seeing 100% occupancy in those shelters, correct? No, it was about 75%. Okay, okay. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, kind of echo what uh, Alvaro Nunez talked about when it comes to the private property owners. I want to thank Councilmember Lopez for bringing it up. You know, when I brought up my council member item last meeting about having contact information at these shopping centers, it's because you have these large out of town corporate property owners who don't seem to respond when it comes to maintaining their property. God knows if uh, our grass is overgrown, I know I'd see Alvaro and his team, but the, the thing that's so frustrating because it's one thing if it's a smaller site, but especially for Ward 4 down in South Bristol, we're seeing so much activity and a lot of that activity could be resolved by simply putting up gating, uh, lights, extra cameras, things that would deter criminal activity and we're seeing neglect. 
Um, for those that, that know on the South End, we've got one shopping center where there's one person covering the entire shopping center that goes almost three quarters of a mile in length. That's ridiculous. It's, it's understaffed. And so I appreciate the dialogue between my colleague and, and Mr. Nunez because it's crime prevention through environmental design accepted. And that's something that law enforcement has always preached and uh, planning has as well. Uh, but I want to ask you, uh, Ken, or maybe it's Alvaro. So God forbid we actually have property owners that say, hey, you know what? Maybe there are some ways that I could deter criminal activity on my property with some improvements. And by the way, we've had some shopping centers, even in my ward, that have actually been proactive in doing this. But for those that are on the fence and are looking for advice on what improvements they should do for their property, who should they contact from city staff? So I know that I speak for Alvaro Nunez, as always, <laughs> and say that I know his staff is more than willing to go out there and, and take that meeting. I know that the police department has staff specifically trained in SEPTED, and I will also go out and go talk to anybody about what are some things they can do to better target harden their property so that not only do they have to spend less money on damage, but... Um, they'll be better neighbors for the community. Alvaro? Yes. <laughs> so that, that is the key. So the idea is to make sure that um, when we offer advice, we don't make it worse. So, and I'll give you a good example. There's this property and that really stands out. And people are surprised. Hey, how come we don't put gates in the little soffit areas, right? Why don't we just make sure that it's guarded so people um, don't sleep when, when the business is closed? But there are also other requirements, right? Building code requires, uh, fire code requirements. So we have to be sure when we make recommendations to address one issue, we don't complicate it and then endanger those um, folks, you know, using that business. But that being the case, like we do with South Bristol, um, some of them didn't respond to the original emails, requests for meetings. So now we're calling them out and we're saying, hey, can you do Tuesday at 9 or can you do Tuesday at 10? Right, so the idea is now we have to be proactive, we have to be very diligent. That this takes a little bit of planning and time, but it is you know this is, uh, us and court enforcement going out, and we're also going with the um, like uh, Ken said, uh, PD there because we have uh, folks that deal with the uh, public uh, safety issues, and we make those type of recommendations. We're going out through the whole property. And says okay, what can you do? Uh, trim the bushes, like we said, put some extra lighting, uh, make sure that there's a lock on that um, water faucet. Right? If that electrical goblet does not be used, take it out. Things that don't make it an attraction so it doesn't become a problem. If, if we require them to make, install some level of gates, as long as they're open during off, uh, office hours, then that's okay. If it's vacated, we make sure that if there's things that are locked, there's folks not being locked inside the building in case of an emergency. So that's what that takes a little bit of time, but that's what we're doing. So, so to answer my question, they're calling you then? Us and, and uh, security, but yes, it, it's a team effort. Oh, no, 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 I mean, I mean just in regards to if a property owner wants yes. city input to yes. improve their property. Yes, okay. and we'll probably put that on the website moving forward. Okay, and by the way, Alvaro and Ken, thank you guys, because honestly, with the two of you, you've done a lot to help us on South Bristol. I know we're a long ways away from getting right. to where we want to be, but I know that we're making the progress, so uh, thank you guys for that. And Mayor, that's all I have. Um, Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council Member Pedialos. Thank you, Mayor Sarmiento, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Gaminski, for the presentation. Though, I'm going to ask the question again that my colleague asked because I want to make sure that we hear it twice if what you're telling us is what's supposed to happen. Um, I have uh, a niece and nephew. One's 10 years old and one's four. The nephew's four. Occasionally, they tricked me into taking them shopping to Target, mostly, to get LOL dolls and all this other stuff. So we're walking out of Target, and we come across, it's happened already, where we come across a naked man, just acting all over the place, in the parking lot, on Bristol and Alton, usually around the railroad tracks, but bouncing back and forth, crossing the street. Can I call 911? because there is a man exposing himself to my four-year-old nephew and 10-year-old niece. I can tell you that you can call 911 anytime you believe that there is an emergency. 
whether 911 will take the phone call or tell you to call the regular phone number, that's up to 911. But, but to your point, mm -hmm. any time that somebody is running around naked, my first thought is not that they're just running around naked, is that they're running around naked because they're either experiencing some type of drug delirium that has caused them to decide that their body's overheating and now I have to take off all my clothes, which happens all the time, and should necessitate an immediate law enforcement and probably fire response to make sure that that person's okay. Or if that person is having some kind of a psychological event that required them to take off all their clothes and run around crazy, then they're probably a danger to themselves, a danger to others, a danger to traffic. What Councilmember Lopez talked about was what can be done. I took that as what can be done as far as enforcement. I'm telling you that you as a council member or any other member of the, any other resident of the city of Santa Ana has the right to call the police department anytime they believe they have an issue. But more importantly than that, the what you're talking about, about people running around naked should, in my belief, necessitate some type of uh, public safety response. Okay. Now, if the person were to just be standing there naked um, near the parking lot, exposing themselves to minors, my four-year-old nephew and 10-year-old niece, would that be considered indecent exposure to a minor, therefore necessitating some kind of either, obviously, paramedics to get them help because no one just hangs out naked outside a shopping center or... Um, law enforcement to make sure they're there or help them cover up because I'm not going to do that if I'm with my four-year-old nephew and 10-year-old niece which because they're watching that too are they not victims of indecent exposure and I, I'm trying to understand if that because is that would be a, a misdemeanor yes but that doesn't cover indecent exposure um, that would be the SAMC violation, what you're discussing. For the most part, most of the calls for service, since we're talking about naked people, most of the calls for service that I have been a part of and responded to or uh, seen, very rarely do we see fully naked people about. Most of the, uh, the calls for service in regards to some type of nakedness are people urinating in public and people call about that being an indecent exposure or people defecating in public, which happens, uh, as well as people that walk down the street with their uh, pants around their knees and they just keep walking. Any of those responses, any of those issues should necessitate some type of law enforcement or OCFA response to make sure that person is okay. I believe. At a minimum, I believe that somebody from the SMART team should go out and try to contact them. If the person still remains exposed when the officer's there, then that is a violation of SAMC for, nudity, for public nudity. If a person wishes to engage in a private person's arrest when the officer wasn't there, that's another step that can be taken. Okay. So I guess... I'm, I'm just trying to understand because like my colleague, I oftentimes get, you know, get tagged. We all get tagged on these, these uh, videos on social media and get sent these videos via text or email of just nudity. And, and uh, it, it's troubling that our families have to deal with this and live with it. So th they're, they, would they be able to call 911 at first? I mean, to... uh, as stated, council member, if you see somebody running around the parking lot at Target completely nude, I think that's probably an unusual incident that would require some type of response. Uh, I think that that person is probably having some type of mental issue or some kind of narcotics related issue. Okay. Um, 
I believe that if they're running in and out of traffic, that always necessitates a 911 call and a code three lights and siren response from law enforcement to try to keep that person out of the intersection or out of traffic uh, so that not only they don't become injured, but anybody doesn't become involved in a traffic accident trying to avoid them. Okay, thank you. That, that clarified that part. I just wanna make sure that our residents know that they are able to call law enforcement and report this, whether it's Seguero CFA or police, because the instances that I've come across, it's not just a, a quick exposure and then cover themselves up, it, it lingers. Uh, so if a police officer were to show up within 20, 30 minutes, they would probably see the same exposure that was just experienced by my four-year-old nephew and 10-year-old niece. But appreciate it, Mr. Gaminski, thank you. Understood, sir, thank you. Okay, to you, uh, Council Member Mendoza. Thank you, Mayor uh, Tarento. My question to Officer, or actually, um, Mr. Kaminsky, is that number that you handed out earlier, I, I believe it was 714-242-3706. Is that the number that a homeless individual or someone else who is trying to help the homeless individual, when they call to get the, some kind of services, let's say the homeless person that refuses to have um, the other kind of services uh, or to go into a shelter, but maybe they need help with medications or maybe just the bath or washing their clothes someplace, what number can they call to just get, uh, let's say, some services? So you're a little difficult to hear, ma'am, but I think I understand your, your question. With that being said, the SMART team that can again be reached at 714-242-3706, they can offer assistance not just for shelter opportunities, but they can connect homeless individuals with all kinds of different nonprofit service providers based on whatever needs that individual has. If a person is trying to help someone else get out of homelessness, then you can call that number to get information uh, in regards to helping. Thank you, I appreciate that. That was my question. And I would also like to uh, personally thank you for the clearing up the homeless issue that occurred on Sunday over on Sullivan and McFadden. It was clean and um, really nicely done by the time I got back. So I was concerned for, um, for the pedestrians that were in the area. So thank you very much for clearing that up so quickly. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Ken, for that presentation and for responding. You know, uh, we did have quite a few questions and answers, but um, these are more informational. So th this should be information that we are providing or direction that we're giving to staff as opposed to having an exchange because then we could be uh, uh, going beyond the scope of what this item is. And if we need to have a, a more thorough Q&A, maybe what we do is agendize this, uh, Madam City Manager, so that way we don't get ourselves into trouble. But uh, Ken, I just wanted to thank you personally because I know that you attended along with me uh, 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 Supervisor Foley who represents District 2 at the County Board of Supervisors, I think last week or the week before, um, the only hearing I've ever been invited to by the uh, by a supervisor that represents this district. So in the 15 years I've been here, that was the one and only time that I've ever been invited to, to that chamber to discuss uh, the, the, the issue and the crisis of homelessness. And so, uh, Ken, you did a great job. And just so all of you know, the whole point of that discussion was to uh, call mayors from different cities throughout the county uh, and try to figure out how much we've all spent and aggregate that together on trying to address the uh, the issue of uh, the impact of homelessness on, on our communities. And uh, really uh, the supervisor's purpose and point was to demonstrate that these are monies that should have rightfully been spent by the county 
towards these efforts and towards these services. So Ken, you did a, a, a great job. Uh, to, uh, to other people's points about the response time when it comes to uh, sitting at, but you know, what I'd like to do is, um, you know, I know 24 minutes is, is, is probably not something that we all uh, probably find a lot of um, uh, satisfaction in because I know, you know, I've had some residents call, I've had to call myself uh, and it's been more extended. We know that sometimes these encounters, uh, because we're dealing with humans and, and not just simply painting over a wall, uh, you know, you can get through that really quickly, but when you're dealing with a person going through crisis, going through um, a, a, an episode, it does take time. You don't just go in and out. So what I'd like you to do is, um, and take this just more as a comment, let us know how, you know, what support you need um, to maybe improve that response time. Uh, I am heartened to hear that, um, that you know, our, our, our officers are being relieved uh, of having to deal with some of these responses so they can do more, uh, you know, police core functions and respond to those. So that's all I will say on that. With respect to care court, I completely agree with uh, council member Fan's point about uh, just this really delicate balance of, you know, uh, being too invasive when it comes to violating a person's um, own civil liberties and rights. And uh, she's right, there was a time that, um, you know, most folks were institutionalized and kept in congregate care and were basically just uh, held uh, involuntarily. Uh, the problem is, is that now we um, have swung sort of the other way and we uh, are dealing with uh, people who don't uh, have the ability to make informed consent as to uh, whether or not they want to be on their own or whether or not they want to be services. So right now the big city mayors are struggling with this whole issue of care courts. And I think uh, all of us uh, to, a, to, a, to a person uh, of the big 13 mayors have supported the care courts in concept. There's still some details that are being um, uh, dealt with uh, through the legislative process. I believe it just made it out of the le uh, legislative uh, Senate Legislative Committee. Uh, so uh, it will be very difficult because for me, uh, you know, I am very concerned about violating a person's uh, own personal uh, uh, in, in independent and autonomous rights. But at the same time, you have those have to be balanced against the rights of those uh, uh, families that live in our, in our community, in our city, that are low-income people of color. And uh, they also have a right not to have these, um, these impacts on their community. So these are very, very profound, difficult questions. But I think that uh, the governor and his team that are proposing this, uh, they're creating a good forum for those uh, who are concerned about this because I know that the ACLU and Disability Rights California have already filed uh, a strong opposition to uh, the care court concept. But I think that at least we're having the conversation. Uh, I think a good result will come out of it. Uh, and this conversation needs to be had because whatever we're doing now, uh, we're spending millions on uh, on, on capital improvements and creating placements and continuums of housing. But if people refuse those placements and those services, then uh, all this money will be uh, will be spent uh, 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 fruitlessly and not really trying to accomplish the goal that we all want, which is to provide people help and provide people uh, uh, a roof over their head and services so they can transition back into society. So that is it. I will make sure I keep you all posted on, on where the big city mayors uh, land on the care courts issue, but uh, let's go ahead and move along to the next to the next item, which is. Um